Today's uh, sermon passage is Revelation, and Revelation 21, verses 9 through 27. If you want to go ahead and open the Pew Bibles to that page, we will get to that in, within the sermon, so you'll be invited to read along within the sermon. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is life and your promise is trustworthy and true. By the power of your Holy Spirit, write your word upon our hearts so that we may be a new creation. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the significance of numbers, as we talked about in the children's message. Numbers have meaning to God, and often certain numbers have special meaning. Today, we are exploring the different meanings, or, um, d- different meanings of number 12 or the different things that number 12 might symbolize. You'll find the number 12 used in 187 places in the Bible. And there are some significances to this number. The number 12 seems to be very important to God as it represents, in most cases, the number of perfection and authority, but we'll also discover it's used to represent inclusiveness. Some biblical significance, significances that are associated with the number 12 are Jesus spoke to the 12 disciples who later became the 12 apostles. Jesus' first recorded words were spoken at the age of 12. There were 12 tribes in Israel, and this symbolizes the completeness of the nation Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, which were the heads or fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. There are 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. And I do want to make a note here. Um, The minor prophets are called minor prophets not because they're less important than the other prophets in the Old Testament, but because their books are smaller. But there are 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. There are 12 historical books in the Bible, and I will list them for you. They are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. There were 12 men who laid 12 stones in a built, when they built a monument to the Lord, and that's found in Joshua 4, verse 3. In the book of Revelation, which is where we're going to be looking at today, we will see the number 12 mentioned 22 different times. In Revelation 7, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will be saved near the end of our present world, and that actually represents um, people from all people groups. There are 12 precious stones that will be used as the foundation of the New Jerusalem. The wall of the New Jerusalem has 12 foundations with the 12 names of the apostles on each wall. The New Jerusalem, which descends out of heaven, has 12 gates, each one made of pearl, which are manned by 12 angels. Each of the gates has been named after one of the 12 tribes of Israel. As you can see, the number 12 is significant. And there are many other instances throughout Scripture that are related to it. But suffice it to say that God prescribed this number to have meaning and to have purpose. As we stated, a few of the meanings and purposes are governmental authority, completeness or perfection, the authority given to mankind by God, and inclusion. And today we are looking at inclusion. We'll see it in Revelation 21 verses 9 through 27. This is a vision of the new Jerusalem, and if you don't want to read along with it in the scripture, I would invite you to maybe close your eyes 
and envision the New Jerusalem as I read it to you, because this passage is, um, is set for that. It is very visual. So let's go to the word of our Lord. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And this, in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations, and on them are 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which the angel was using. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundation of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carne carnelian, the seventh chrysotile, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth caryopsis, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl. And the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The, nation will the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory to it. The gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The New Jerusalem is the kingdom of heaven, the new world, at the culmination of time as we know it. It will descend from heaven at some point in the future, and Scripture tells us that at that time, God will reign supreme in grace and truth and peace and justice. This is a picture of God's perfect world. The author of Revelation is John, and the first thing that John noted about the New Jerusalem is the great jewel-like lamp which lights the city. He described the materials used to build the New Jerusalem. The wall is of jasper. Its foundation layers are encrusted with precious stones. Its gates are pearls. And the streets and buildings within are made of transparent gold. But then John changed his focus and wrote something interesting, or I thought it was interesting anyway. He noticed the series of things which the city does not have, and he made note of them. The New Jerusalem does not have a temple. There's no sun or no moon. There's no night. There's no evil. 
and there are no closed gates. In Revelation 21, 25, we read, the gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there because of the bright light illuminating the center of the city. The bright light is the light of Christ. And I want you to hold that in your memory because we're going to come back to that at the end of this sermon. The bright light in the center is the light of Christ. The gates of the New Jerusalem will never be shut. Everyone who dwells there, all people groups, are welcome in. And they are free to come and go as they want and as they choose. But I don't think anyone will want to leave. Because as children of God, we want nothing more than to live in his holy presence. To worship him and to praise him. Living in wholeness and wellness and grace and truth. John's vision in Revelation of the New Jerusalem is a picture of God's perfect world. As I said before, in God's perfect world, the gates that guard the kingdom will never be shut. Gates represent safety, boundaries, exclusion, and inclusion. In the Old Testament writings, A lot of information about gates and walls is included. Gates were considered necessary for healthy and safe living, especially at night. There was no electricity, and troublemakers and evildoers could hide. They could sneak into the city and cause all kinds of harm under the cover of darkness. And people closed the gates at nighttime, and they guarded them by day to keep everyone safe. For those living in Old Testament times, gates were part of their culture. And today, we still see gates and fences. We see physical walls used as boundaries and safeguards. At airports, we walk through gates. Sporting events and concerts are held in gated territories. The state fair that many of us went to is held on gated property. We have gated communities, gated schoolyards. Not long ago, Speaking of gated communities, my family got locked into a gated community. It's a lot easier than you would think, we found out. We took a wrong turn in an unfamiliar neighborhood. It was filled with beautiful homes and manicured lawns, and we didn't notice the gates due to the heavy traffic. You see, where we were, all of Not all, but many of the roads were entitled Queen. Like it would say Queen's Way, Queen's Route, Queen's Road. We did not pay attention to the second word. We saw the word Queen's. And we were following the line of traffic, and we followed a car directly into a gated neighborhood. We thought it was a turn to our hotel, but it wasn't. And the gate shut behind us. After explaining to the guardhouse attendant that we were vacationing Illinoisans lost in the low country of South Carolina, we were released. It took about 10 minutes of explaining that she was kind and let us go. We all had a good laugh before it was over, but the incident sparked conversation in my family in the car ride back to the hotel about how gates can be both beneficial and oppressive. For those who lived in the neighborhood, the gates were beneficial. They, were, they meant safety, and they kept the people safe at night or from whatever might be out there. But for my family, those gates were oppressive. They held us in, and we could not get out until my husband, Dennis, went up and spoke to the guardhouse attendant. And as I said, she was kind. Some gates and boundaries are created to keep people safe, and we need them. They are useful. They are helpful. But some gates cause and perpetuate oppression and exclusivity and unhealthy separation. Still other gates are put up because of fear. We often fear what we don't understand. Especially when it comes to people who are different from us. Different socioeconomic levels different religions, different denominations, different beliefs, different genders, sexual orientations, different people groups, those who wear different brands and carry different labels. You see, the gates we set are not always made of steel and wood and concrete or brick. 
Sometimes they're made of labels, sometimes they're made of ribbons. Green ribbon, you're outside our group. Red ribbon, you're with us. Humanity has put up all sorts of boundaries and gates. And we judge who gets to come in our territories, who gets to come in our gated areas, and who is excluded from those areas. It's God's job to judge. It's God's job to judge. It's not my job to judge. And it's not your job to judge. The task of judging does not belong to any person or group or denomination or industry. But in our humanness, we do it. We judge whether we mean to or not, and whether we want to or not, we do it. Most of the time, especially in this church, and I'm thankful for that because I have noticed, I, I notice things like this um, more often than not. Um, this church is compassionate. It's generous. It's open-minded and inclusive, and it's welcoming. It's welcoming of all people. We say it every Sunday. Everyone's welcome at our table. And these are positive character traits. We should strive to live that way. Jesus told us to live that way. And as long as we're with others who think like us and believe like us, it's easy to be inclusive. It's not hard. It's much harder to be inclusive when we know the person does not think like us or does not believe like us. It's hard to invite people into our groups who we fear or who we don't understand. What if the one who wants to join our group or wants to be included inside our gate is very conservative or very liberal or very... You fill in the blank with something you disagree with. I wonder about my own gates and my own boundaries and my own walls. Who have I excluded? I know I've done it. I didn't mean to, but I know I have. Who have I blocked from my territory because I disagree with them? Who do I fear and who do I not understand? I want to challenge you this week to ask yourself those same questions. I don't have all the answers to this. I wish I did, but I don't. I think the Bible does. I think gates are symbolic, and I think they are significant. The New Jerusalem, which descends from heaven, has 12 gates, and they never close. They never close. The New Jerusalem also has a light, and that light is Christ, is Jesus, and it shines continually. So there is no fear, and there is no need for gates. In John 10, 9, we learn that Jesus is the gate. He said, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved. They will come in, and they will go out. Freedom. In John 8, 12, we learn that Jesus is the light. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the life he's talking about here is Zoe, that is eternal life, both now and in heaven with God. In Galatians and in Romans, we learn that Jesus dwells in us. We have the light of Jesus in us, and we are to use it as a light that overcomes darkness and overcomes fear. We are to invite everyone to come and receive wholeness and wellness and grace and truth and peace that we've received from Christ. We have the light of Jesus in us. I hope that every time you see the number 12, you are reminded of this you are reminded that you have the light of Christ in you. And that light of Christ makes a way for gates to remain open, just as the gates are open in God's perfect world in the New Jerusalem. 
We are God's representatives here on earth, and we are called to be, an op- to be open and invite people to share in the same light that we've received. Every week during our Numbers series, we have given you a challenge and invited you to act on what we've talked about here in service. And today, if you look on your yellow sheet, insert at the bottom, the challenge is to to be intentional and share God's grace and truth and love and peace with 12 people this year. And that's not hard to do. But what I would ask you to do is make a list of 12 names, the people who you've been meaning to share God's love with but just haven't got around to it yet, and be intentional to share his love with them. Another way you can do it is to invite people to our services here. We have Central Celebration coming up. I know Don has his... Um, concert series brochure out on the Welcome Center. Did I see that earlier? It's it's out there, and you can grab one of those and hand those out and invite people to come to a concert. Music is a language of the heart. It's a good way to get people here. Another way to do it is to go out and share the gospel through encouraging words and acts of kindness, acts of kindness and service. I know that a lot of you do that already, but I'm going to encourage you and maybe challenge you to think of a new way you can go out and share the gospel message with people. And with that, let us pray. Watching for a new heaven, praying for a new earth, God, as you have revealed your grace and glory to us this day through your message, we pray that you help us live out the truth received laying to rest the former things and making all things new on earth as it is in heaven. Through Christ we pray. Amen.